Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining us from around the world. On behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, welcome to our second annual Global Forum with the theme this year of competition in the global marketplace. I can't think of a more consequential time to be holding this forum. Last year, we gathered after living in a year of global pandemic to discuss ways to lift out of darkness and into recovery. That conversation is certainly still relevant today, but now we contend with the new crisis. Russia's brazen and unprovoked war in Ukraine has tested the world and shaken the foundations of the post-Cold War democratic order. It has cost thousands of innocent lives, sparked an international energy crisis, and raised the specter of a global food crisis. But we know that Russia's aggression did not happen in a vacuum. Over the past decade, democracy and free markets have been challenged, while autocracies have spread, often undermining free enterprise and market-based economic growth. There is a contest for influence that extends beyond Ukraine. It's happening today, and its outcome will affect the world for generations. At the Chamber, we know that all of us, all of you, play a central role in this competition. That's why we have been full-throated in our support for Ukraine's sovereignty, working with government and business to ensure that every instrument of economic statecraft is used to combat this aggression. It's why Ukrainian members of our affiliate, the Center for International Private Enterprise, and our partners at AmCham Ukraine have continued their missions of advancing free enterprise, market-based reform, and closer ties between our countries. It's why the U.S. and Europe have been more united than at any point since World War II. Not only are we standing up together for our values, we're standing stronger together as partners. Just yesterday, we met here at the Chamber with leaders of more than 30 AmChams across Europe to discuss how we continue to strengthen the transatlantic relationship, which is worth $6 trillion and critical to maintaining global order and stability. Time and time again in Ukraine and around the world, we have seen the fates of democracy and free enterprise are intertwined. When American companies trade and invest in other countries, they bring their values with them. Values like transparency and the rule of law. Free enterprise raises living standards. It contributes to stability and prosperity. So business is widely seen as a partner in helping countries around the world build a better, more prosperous future. Against the backdrop of this terrible war, American business is doing our part. We are engaging in the debate of ideas. Every day, we advocate for openness, the rule of law, and shared prosperity. The question now becomes, what more can we do to advance these goals? What more can we do together? The first priority should be obvious. The heart of free enterprise engagement is trade. But right now, that heart is beating slowly, at least for the United States. While other economies race to ink new deals, the U.S. has not entered an agreement with a new trade partner in a decade. And the current administration, consumed by caution and internal views, is doing little to change that. In fact, it is yet to pick even the lowest hanging fruit, such as trade agreements that were already underway with UK or Kenya, some of our closest allies. Meanwhile, Europe is charging ahead. The EU has 46 trade agreements with 78 countries. The US has just 14 with 20 countries. America needs to get back in the game. That's why the US Chamber is pressing the administration and Congress to embrace a robust trade agenda. The fundamental reasons are simple, are simple and well-known. First, our economy depends on trade. For U.S. businesses to compete successfully in the global marketplace, a drive for new market-opening trade agreements is essential. Indeed, 40 million American jobs depend on trade. Half of all U.S. manufacturing output is destined for export markets. Agriculture is similarly dependent on export markets, as is America's sizable service sector, thanks to digital trade. The administration inherited tariffs on nearly $400 billion in imported goods. Make no mistake, tariffs are taxes, and American families are the ones paying them. Tariff relief must be a priority for the Biden administration. Second, trade advances our foreign policy goals. Since the presidencies of FDR and Truman, trade agreements have been deployed to strengthen our allies and partners in ways that directly advance U.S. foreign policy priorities, including the spread of democracy. Look at Southeast Asia, whose leaders are traveling to Washington for a summit with President Biden this week. Their governments and people are watching China's assertive moves
closely. They do not want to face a choice between solely trading with China or America. They all want to expand their ties with us, and we need to create a way for them to do so. Third, trade supports our national security. For example, consider how Russia's invasion of Ukraine has roiled global energy markets. The world is watching as Russia uses its exports of oil and natural gas to not only fund its war machine, but also to blackmail Europe. We saw how Putin cut off supplies to Bulgaria and Poland out of retaliation for their opposition to the invasion of Ukraine. America remains the world's top producer of oil and natural gas, the cleanest by far. Yet we have been far too timid about using those resources to strengthen our economic and strategic influence abroad. President Biden has committed to accelerating energy exports to Europe, and the Chamber is working with the administration and Congress to ensure this represents a long-term shift in American energy policy. That means not only producing more American energy, but also building the necessary infrastructure at home and helping finance energy infrastructure abroad. This is how we strengthen the energy security of our allies and partners around the globe. Despite Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the fundamental challenge remains. America is in many ways standing still when it comes to new trade agreements. And if you're standing still on trade, you're falling behind. That's why when I travel to Berlin for the B7 in June, I intend to make the case to our largest partners that the American business community is surging forward, even if our government isn't. Our members are competing robustly through trade and investment and will never stop making the case for engagement and commercial diplomacy. This takes on greater urgency as China continues to rise as a competitor. China was one of 15 Asian economies that kicked off this year with a massive trade pact that tears down tariffs and other trade barriers across the region. Once upon a time, our answer to China was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Remember the TPP? Well, the U.S. pulled out, and now it's the U.K., Korea, Taiwan, and yes, China, trying to join while we stand on the outside, looking in. Later this month, President Biden will travel to Japan and Korea, where he'll discuss his new Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, a new pared-down trade pact with our partners. We're working closely with the administration to shape it to its fullest potential, but it remains a far cry as a replacement for the TPP. Beyond the Indo-Pacific also must show our commitment to the continued growth of free enterprise on the African continent, where new hubs for technology, energy, healthcare, and creative sectors are emerging. The recently implemented African Continental Free Trade Area offers a new competitive arena for American business to engage, an opportunity we must move quickly to seize. China is competing robustly in that market. We can and will too. To that end, we met with President of Tanzania last month, and we signed an MOU to reinvigorate our bilateral trade partnership. We hosted a signing ceremony for investments and deals worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Companies from all around the globe are also competing to seize commercial opportunities and partnerships in Latin America. The U.S. network, the US network of trade agreements is strongest in the Western Hemisphere, but that doesn't mean we can rest on our laurels. There are vast opportunities that U.S. companies will miss if we neglect that region that includes our closest neighbors. This is sure to be a topic of discussion at the Summit of the Americas held in Los Angeles next month. The Chamber is delighted to be hosting the CEO Summit held in conjunction with the Summit of the Americas meeting with heads of state. Even as we pursue new agreements, we must continually work to enforce the ones we already have. This is particularly important with Mexico, our largest trading partner. In late March, I traveled to Mexico City to discuss opportunities to strengthen our partnership, but also to remind Mexico's leaders that failure to keep their commitments under the USMCA will have real-world consequences. We're troubled by the anti-competitive turn the Mexican government has taken, particularly in its electricity market, but also in its legal and regulatory environments. It goes to show that free enterprise can't be taken for granted and must be nurtured and protected everywhere. The challenges we face around the world are real, but free enterprise is the ultimate competitive advantage. History proves it. Just a few short decades ago, it was widely argued that countries such as Germany, Italy, Japan, and South Korea couldn't become democracies. The leaders and intellectuals who said that were wrong, repeatedly and happily wrong. And contributing powerfully to progress in those countries was trade. Global engagement, trade, and investment helped transform those countries. Today, they are prosperous, consolidated democracy. Critics will note that it doesn't work everywhere. And that's true. 
Russia is a case in point. Russia has taken a sharp turn back to autocracy despite decades of commercial engagement. But we must hold fast to the courage of our convictions. Free enterprise, free markets, and free trade have a proven track record as forces of positive change around the globe. The war in Ukraine is a searing reminder that these values are precious and fragile. As we speak, Ukrainians are fighting and dying for them. All of us have a role in fortifying our democracy and the free enterprise system that supports it. For the business community's part, that means getting louder. Too often, really serious consequential debates are dominated by extremists because they're the loudest and the most outrageous and they drown out voices of reason. These voices need to be heard. We need to unapologetically stand up for the free enterprise system that allowed our nation to build the most dynamic, diverse, and resilient economy in history. Together, we can show what democracy can offer. Let's show what free enterprise can deliver worldwide, how it can solve problems, save lives, and strengthen societies. I wanna thank each of you today for all you do to spread free enterprise around the world. Thank you very much.